Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth webinar in our webinar series. And today we're covering social finance. So um, we're really excited about this webinar. We have some really great guests joining us from um, Nigeria. Um, we're going to give folks a few more minutes to join the call. In the meantime, um, the French interpretation is on. So you can access this webinar in French as well. And in preparation for our breakout groups, can you all, if possible, change your name, putting the, your language next to your name? Like for instance, you should be able to see my name here with English. So if you can change it to your name, whether you speak English, Spanish, or French, that would really be helpful. Um, so thank you for your patience. Please bear with us for a few moments as we wait for other folks to join the call. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Azo, for changing your name. Cedric, I see you there. Hey, 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 bro, can you please change your name to French? Or if you want to hear it in English or you want to break out, be in an English speaking breakout group, that's fine as well. Kosi, Gotri, welcome to the call. If possible, please change your name. Uh, Mamadou, I see that you're on the phone, so I understand if you can't change your name, that's fine. If you're on the phone and you can't change your name, that's fine. If you can, please do. Um, that will make things much easier for us. Thank you, David. All right, we're gonna give ourselves one more minute and then we'll be getting started. If you've just joined the call, welcome. Um, and we're really looking forward to hosting our guest today on the topic of social finance. Um, if you haven't already, please change your name um, to, uh, to include your language. So as you can see here, my name is Mark Carr and I have English. Um, if you speak, whether you want to be in a breakout room based on your language, please make sure that um, your, your language is updated, whether it's French, English, or Spanish. Um, we're gonna break you all in breakout rooms according to your language. So whatever language you prefer, some of you are bilingual, whatever language you prefer, please update your name with the language that you want to be assigned to in your breakout rooms. Okay, it is 9.04 folks. Um, we wanted to give folks a few uh, minutes to join, but I think this is a good time to join. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar, welcome to the call. We're really excited to have our guests present today all the way from Nigeria. Um, I'm gonna let our country lead Paula introduce them and introduce the webinar. Um, before we get, before we allow Paula to do that, I just want to, uh, first of all, thank you for all of your effort and time. This is the fifth webinar. So you all have all come a long way. And as a reminder, the exercise associated with this webinar is going to be one of the exercises we require in order for you to get your certification. Um, so please keep that in mind. Uh, but without further ado, I want to let Paula introduce um, the, the West Africa team, the Lagos office that have worked so hard to put this together. And she will also introduce our distinguished guest, Paula. Thank you so much, Mark, for that introduction. My name is Paula Ogu, as Mark has said. 
I'm the regional rep for Amex in Anglophone West Africa. I'm also the youth and partnership lead for the region. And today we're so excited to be hosting this webinar it's titled Social Finance. And we have three ABLE experts today with us on the call. We're blessed to have two Ashoka Fellows. The first is Theresa Michael, who will be handling the facilitation and coordination of this webinar. And we also have Neka Mobison, who is an Ashoka Fellow, and also the CEO and co-founder of MDOC. And her ABLE colleague and co-founder, Imo Etuk, who would also be supporting her with this presentation. So Theresa Michael, the floor is yours. Hello, Theresa. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Can you, can you hear me now, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. As already introduced, my name is Theresa Michael. The theme of our conversation today is finance for social impact. And as we all know, finance is one of the critical pillars of organizational growth. How we go about it can make all the difference to so the much needed uh, funds you know, we, we want to assess and for, to enable us to get to where we want to be. And that is making impact for systems change. We have today two able speakers already introduced, Neka and uh, Imo, who will address this uh, topic very competently. Please join me to welcome the speakers, Neka Mobisin, and Imo Etuk. We have 30 minutes for the presentation and uh, we, we hope um, we'll have all the information we need. Please listen attentively because you'll be needing a lot of information in your breakout session later. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Neka. Teresa, thank you so much, Teresa. Um, and, and really to the whole Ashoka Africa and uh, broader Ashoka team. Um, it's really been a pleasure uh, preparing this session for you all um, in terms of our background, uh, as, as um, has been highlighted. I'm an Ashoka fellow, um, I'm a, a physician, um, but also a physician turned entrepreneur uh, with a background in um, development. So prior to co-founding MDOC with Imo, I led the Africa portfolio for a US-based um, NGO uh, focused on healthcare. Uh, so look forward to sharing a lot just um, from my vantage point uh, around this very, very important topic. Yes, thank you so for that, Neka. As uh, Theresa has shared, my name is Imo I took I'm co-founder and CTO of MDOC, uh, and I'm really excited to be with you here today. So just uh, without further ado, we'll just jump right into the uh, session. Um, um, I'm going to try and speak slowly for our French, our French speaker so we can, we get, can get translated. Um, I'm a pretty fast speaker, but I'll try and keep it slow. Uh, You have muted. Sorry, I didn't mean. Sorry, my mic uh, muted me. Can you guys hear us again? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect, okay. All right, so just in terms of the content of this presentation, we broke it into six distinct parts, uh, five of which we will go over here and one will be in the breakout room. So we'll first start first with what the social enterprise is, uh, what the funding gaps uh, are, um, what the you know, funding options that are available for us social enterprises are, um, what the funding strategy is uh, to actually get in this investment, unlocking this investment so we can have uh, social, social impact that we started our organizations for, um, and how to really get ready for investment. And then, you know, after we do that, we'll go into the breakout session to just move this so that there's no... And our hope is that yeah. we want to make this as interactive as possible, um, recognizing that, you know, Many of you also have tons of experience um, in this 
arena, maybe in certain areas more so than others. So please feel free to, you know, uh, share your experience throughout the, the discussion as well. Yeah. Okay, so just wanted to start by just, um, again, finding out where everyone is from. Um, uh, we, we thought we could annotate, uh, use the annotate function in Zoom. And if everyone could just uh, click here. Go to the top of your screen. screen go to annotate and then click uh, a stamp, stamp of, of where you are calling in from. And you could just stamp the country so that we can see where everyone is uh, actually calling in from. Uh, just so that we can get a sense of what where we all are, where we all and what the distribution is. If if that's not possible, you can also just chat that in yeah. uh, as an alternative, and then we could take it from there. Just do a one more minute. Yes. Yeah, no that it's, are you able to? Okay, see, I see Karen. In chats, yeah. Okay, Paula. Okay. Okay, so we're. Okay, great. So I, I thought we had some East Africans as well. Maybe on the chats. Yeah, probably on the chat feature. Okay, and then uh, so Mexico, another Nigeria, Josephine, Cameroon on the chats. Fantastic. Okay, so South and North America. Okay. Okay, so fair distribution. Okay, so we can proceed now to the next, uh, into the presentation proper. Let me just stop annotating here. Okay, got control of my mouse again. And yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, we told you a little bit about ourselves. Um, let me clear the annotations. Told you a little bit about ourselves already, but um, in terms of who we are, um, we are um, a, a social enterprise like yourselves. And what we do is or we optimize the end-to-end -end care experience of people who have chronic health needs. Um, sorry, I can turn that up again. Who have chronic health needs by leveraging data, quality improvement, behavioral science, and technology to do so. Um, but enough about us. It's really about, about you and what a social enterprise is. As you all know, a social enterprise is an organization that has been founded for a social, any organization, a business venture organization that is founded for a social purpose, that is, is trying to mitigate a social um, a market failure or, or fix a social problem by leveraging um, the same kind of discipline, financial uh, discipline innovation, as well as um, the determination of a regular, of a, of a traditional business. So you pour all your hearts and minds and souls into trying to ensure that, you know, your businesses are a going concern, but obviously there are funding gaps that usually exist. Um, so as you can see, a social enterprise is the intersection of all these three. It sits right in the middle of everything. But, and then there's a spectrum of social enterprises that also exist in the ecosystem. Um, we kind of got a sense from Paula that we are all along the spectrum, um, mo mostly hovered more around the middle of the spectrum. So more of the social enterprise side with some leaning towards the left. So on the left side, you can see the traditional non-for-profit. So these are companies that are just, just, for, just non-for-profit and there's, you know, everything that they do is plowed back into um, um, generating social returns for the organization. And then it goes all the way to the right where you have um, organizations that are traditional for-profit organizations. And then social enterprises sit right in the middle. 
And what makes a social enterprise different is because there's a balance between there's a balance between um, the mission versus what the market actually needs. So you, while you are solving, um, while, while you are mission driven, you're also trying to solve a market problem, right? So that's the first thing. There's also stakeholder accountability, right? Where you have, like I, I mentioned before, you have the financial um, um, instruments to ensure that you are, you are financially sound over time. And finally, you know, there's, you, you reinvest um, the profits that you earn from the business back into the organization to try and make sure that is a going concern. Um, so what we have here is a traditional uh, graph for companies, right? But even though this is for for-profit companies, right? This same thing is applicable to social enterprises as well, right? Because we all need funding to be able to carry on as a going concern. Um, and so, but there are funding gaps that usually exist when we are trying to raise funding. And some of these funding gaps are as follows. There's usually a gap between what, 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 who, who we are in terms of um, uh, social enterprises and the investors that we're trying to go after. You have to make sure that your mission is aligned with the, with the, with the funding that is available from that investor, for example. If you are a company that is focused on uh, the environment, for example, um, you want to make sure that you get your funding from 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 funders that are actually uh, aligned with your mission, and so not necessarily from uh, a, a maternal health, for example. You just want to make sure that there's that there, there's alignment between funding and your social enterprise. The second thing is just trying to find the right pool of investors. With this one. From my experience, we say you should leverage your, the networks that you already have. Ashoka has a vast pool of, of, of networks and that, that you can tap into, you can certainly tap into to be able to ensure that you are in front of the right investor whose, whose, uh, whose purses are aligned to your social uh, enterprise. And finally, um, you want to make sure that you're going, you're, 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 you're targeting investors that are, are able to fund you, right? Because in, in some instances, you might be looking for investment, but the investor that you're in front of or the funder that you're in front of has a minimum threshold that they can actually, um, that, that they have to, there's a minimum threshold rule that they use to be able to fund you, for example. Um, so you have to make sure that you know what those rules are so that you're able to uh, get in front of the right, right funder, you know, and not, you know, waste your time and waste the funder's time as well. So we were hoping to get a sense of where everybody was in terms of the previous slide. Um, you know, where folks fell around this hybrid spectrum. Uh, so anywhere from traditional uh, nonprofit to uh, I guess, corporation practicing social responsibility. So could you put in the chat section where you fall along this, um, you know, along this uh, spectrum? Are you a traditional nonprofit? Uh, do you have a nonprofit that actually has income generating activities? Um, so you're not just getting grants or donations, but you're also, uh, you also have internally generated revenue. Uh, are you a social enterprise? And, and I'll tell you, I struggle with this a lot because I, I have fundamentally believed that social enterprise, you know, um, a lot falls a kind of across this spectrum um, and is inclusive of, of some of these other elements. Uh, socially responsible, are you a socially responsible business um, or a corporation practicing social responsibility, which I, I also doubt that anyone is here. So just trying to see what, um, okay, so social enterprise, new grid, social enterprise, okay, nonprofit with income generating activities. Okay, and anyone else? Is anyone else in a traditional nonprofit? And I, I don't know if people are able to speak as well or no. Is it social enterprise. I think it's just a chat. Okay, just chat. Okay, all right. So it seems mostly social, enter social enterprise and so far. Okay, hybrid. 
but trying to move to socially responsible business. Okay, so this is from Mamadou. So Mamadou, my question for you is, are you, when you say you're trying, okay, for-profit social enterprise. So, okay, so Tom, Chris, and uh, Mamadou. My question for you all is, are you trying to raise um, money outside of grants? And you can put that in the chat. Or are you just focused on um, on grants, awards, et cetera? But are you trying to uh, raise money for which there will be a return? Can I go? Yes, please. Yeah, so thanks. First of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, obviously, um, our business uh, starts from our nations is the name of the company I run. And eventually, we are planning to fundraise. Uh, the company has been bootstrapped up to now, but uh, we feel that we are in a position where we can, you know, seek investors. Okay. Okay, so it seems like there are at least three people that are saying, so you all are, are, so do you, would you be able to give equity for your company is I guess the question I'm asking. And I'm asking this just so that we know if we should spend any time on impact on, on this, that type of investment. Yes, so the investors we are looking at that we are speaking with are uh, those the types of investors that we are looking at. We are looking at and of course, impact investment. Okay. All right. Okay. So some of you are registered, or some of you are even looking to move from not profit to to uh, for profit. So Daniel, you're saying we've been relying on grants, but we're changing the model. Um, and Mama Di, you're saying, I'm trying to make profits to reinvest. Okay, so that, you know, I guess this really speaks to, again, how you're registered to as a company. So are you registered as a not, you know, not-for-profit? Are you registered as a limited liability or, you know, another form of, uh, of enterprise? And that really matters in terms of what, you know, the type of investment that you can take. Yeah, so the legal structures really matter. And I guess we could... Okay. For my company in Ghana, the, the legal system doesn't allow, uh, such, well, it's not practically recognized to register as a social enterprise. So either you register as a limited liability company or um, a full fledged for, um, what is it called, NGO. So for our company, we registered as a limited liability. Okay, so you're registered as a limited liability. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I guess we can. And then, uh, yeah, and Daniel, you're limited by guarantee, so which a, allows and... social enterprise model of operation. So yeah, so I mean, I think in many countries uh, outside of the United States, which has more around B Corps, et cetera, uh, there's not really this option for social enterprise. So you can choose to register as an NG, uh, a nonprofit or you can choose to register as, for instance, a limited liability or limited by guarantee, but then still uh, function as a social enterprise. Okay, so we'll try to touch upon all the uh, the different elements then. Yeah, okay, so. All right, so we talked about the funding gaps and just being able to mention that, that you know, your mission is aligned to the funding. And it also, it also applies to even on the traditional funding side, right? You wanna make sure that your mission is actually aligned to the right kind of funder, in this case, an impact investor, et cetera. We can touch more on that um, as we go. So just in terms of what the funding options that we've put together uh, based on, you know, what we, we, we on, on what, on what we learned about what the mix of people are. Uh, this is just a traditional uh, route. So you have crowdfunding, you have accelerators, you have traditional grants, um, you have internet, internet generated revenue uh, that you can plow back in, and then you have impact investors. And I would say that, so you have impact investors, but you can also go um, you know, pure play, you know, uh, venture capital, venture capital uh, you know, as well. And, that, you know, and we can, I think you more probably could speak a little bit about that at the impact investment side, just as you're, for those of you that are for profit and registered as limited liability. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 So, so this is, so we wanted to just share with you some of the different options um, to consider in terms of uh, uh, funding. 
So this is from a crowdfunding perspective. And you know, increasingly, um, crowdfunding is, is, is it's really actually growing across the world. Uh, so there are three essential elements. There's um, you know, one type of crowd. So crowdfunding you know, is essentially uh, you, you essentially crowdsourcing investment in your organization. Um, many of us know about GoFundMe um, as an example. Um, there are many other ones, Indiegogo, um, KivaZip, uh, WeFunder, uh, Kikante, et cetera, that allow crowdfunding. And um, there's many region, there are many kind of global ones, but there are also a lot of regional ones. Really I know in South America, yeah. there's been huge growth in um, uh, these crowdfunding options. I think in Africa, we have less of these, uh, but we still can access you know, more of the global ones. So uh, there are three elements um, around which crowdfunding can be structured. On the equity side, you can actually crowdsource uh, investment from people that you don't know, um, where investors will fund a piece of your company and receive a stake in, in the company. Um, I was just uh, it, part, of a, part of a program where another one of um, the, the, my colleagues she, uh, for her medical device company, uh, through uh, this form of equity crowd um, funding, was able to generate uh, over a million dollars in investment, uh, literally over, I think, a course of four months. Uh, so, so there are many examples here, Circle Up, WeFunder, Angels List, and I, we have a whole host more if you're interested in this. And this obviously would only be for those of you who are registered as an LLC, on, as an LLC. Yeah. Uh, if you're a nonprofit, this would not be applicable to you because there wouldn't be any shares by which that could be actually uh, shared. Um, on the debt side, here investors are repaid for their investment over a period of time. So they'll essentially make a, 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 a you know, almost like a uh, a micro loan to you, and uh, all these micro loans will be aggregated into the sum of money that you've requested. And then, um, but you'll have to pay back over an agreed upon period of time that's collected by the organization, whether it's Kiva Zip, up, uh, Prosper, Upstart, et cetera. And then, and you, 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 you know, from a debt perspective, I think the, the typical um, elements matter where you have to be able to pay back that debt yeah. um, if you're going to go down this model, right? So what's your cash flow look like? Uh, you have to take that into consideration if you wanted to go down this model. And then the third is rewards and philanthropy, um, you know, where either investors can receive a tangible item um, or a service, or they don't receive it. They don't receive anything except just updates on what you've been able to achieve with their funds. Um, and so obviously I, this is the most uh, popular Kickstarter, uh, GoFundMe, uh, et cetera. So this is, a, this is and, and I would say to you, just as you think about this, and I'll just go to the next page. Oh, it's not moving. Um, yeah, so these are some of the other examples um, of that ones that you could look up, right? And we try to include ones just for those of you who are interested so that you can literally Google them. And you'll see that we've also included the sources of, of all this information so that you're able to really investigate when you're developing your funding strategy. So, so the, I think the important piece of this is every platform has very, very different rules. Um, they are also businesses in their own element. So they take a percentage of, of the yeah, funds the that, has been raised. Yeah, that have been raised to manage um, the services. A lot of them also have an additional tip or service fee. Um, and so people will be thinking they're donating $200 to you, but in reality, maybe only $150 or $160 comes to you. So you've got to make sure you really study the different platforms so you understand the different rules. Also, you can't just set up a... Um, set it up without really understanding what goes into it. You want to protect, if you are, again, for profit, and even if you're an NGO, you have IP, you have intellectual property. So you want to be sure, um, you know, you're essentially putting it on this platform and you're making, you're ensuring that everyone has access to it. So what are you willing to share and how, what kind of mechanisms are you leveraging to protect your intellectual property? The third piece is like, you want to set up a proper target. You can't have some huge, goal that's not um, not achievable or where the typical person who's on the other side doesn't think is achievable and therefore is less not likely yet. to give yes. to you because they're like, why is this person trying to raise $5 million when they've only been able to manage $5,000 to date? 
Um, and then the next is market your campaign. This is one of the most important elements of crowdfunding. If you're not on social media, get on social media. If you don't, ha don't have a community that's following you, you want to actually invest in all of that before you actually start the campaign. And the last is, again, just do your due diligence. Hopefully you all have lawyers or legal systems that you work with. Be aware of the contractual obligations before you even start this, go, going down this process. But I would highly encourage you to look at this, examine this, um, because I've seen a lot of success stories from people who have crowdfunded. Yeah. Um, the next piece is accelerators. And if you kind of go back to where the initial grant that Imo showed in terms of where are you as an organization, um, it's really important to think about what type of funds are you trying to get at this stage? What stage are you? Um, you know, accelerators over the last decade have, have really, um, you know, grown, um, you know, exponentially. As an Ashoka fellow, I'm, I'm um, you, fortunate that uh, MDOC is part of the Ashoka Boringer Ingelheim Making More Health uh, Accelerator, which has been very helpful to us as uh, an organization. Uh, but not all accelerators are like that. So um, you, as probably many of you have already been in accelerators, um, but they're essentially typically anywhere from three Six to 18 months, months depending on um, the type of accelerators. Many accelerators have alumni programs. So where even if it's just three months, they may support you even afterwards. Uh, they provide you a combination of technical expertise, um, you know, classes, education um, on, on, any, on everything. It can be on your technical area that you're focusing on as well as financing, et cetera. Um, so, and then lastly, they can provide financing. Many accelerators provide grants, um, a lot of them have competitions which generate even more funds um, and they also have amazing networks that can link you to future um, future future funders uh, from our experience I'll actually even say that um, the first accelerator that we were in was mass challenge when we just started as a, as a company and through pitching competitions that we were asked to do we met that's how we, that's met, how we met Boringer Ingelheim yeah. Uh, I, that then, you know, introduced us to Ashoka. So, it, you know, it, and that and that took a few years, but um, and we had no idea. We just thought we were pitching, you know, with a, a like-minded company, and had no idea, you know, kind of the impact that it would have on us as an organization uh, from that period of time. So, just want to encourage this. Uh, however, not all accelerators are created equal. Uh, like I said before. Be clear on your goal for joining an accelerator or for even applying. You do not want to get distracted. Many accelerators can be incredibly distracting and um, some can be phenomenal. Yes. So it's literally a spectrum. And it's also how many people are in your organization. So sometimes you need if you have a team that can um, you know, take advantage or that if you have a solid team that allow you as a co-founder or a founder to be really invested in the accelerator, then that's great. Um, but you really want to understand that from the get-go. The third piece is that, um, you know, like I said, in-kind support can be incredibly helpful. We've really benefited from the technical support and the guidance on multiple levels. And then um, again, like everything else, make sure you understand the requirements of the accelerator before you commit. IP protection, is the area of focus relevant to you? Do you know all of this information? You're very far along the funding gap that this is kind of a waste of your time. Um, so you need to balance the cost and the funding opportunities. And always try to reach out, go on LinkedIn, see who's part of Mass Challenge. People, um, sorry, part of these accelerators, find out, you know, and, and see if you can reach out to them on LinkedIn. People are very willing to speak about their experience um, to learn more. Okay, so now here are grants, right? It seems, seems like a, a number of you have raised grants. Um, as you know, there's restricted versus unrestricted. You can have individual or large donations. For instance, if, you're, if you, if you um, take donations or run campaigns, there's also corporate sponsorship. Um, many people uh, benefit from in-kind gifts from corporates or other companies or even accelerators. A lot of the accelerators have uh, partnerships with other companies that provide in-kind gifts like uh, hosting services, uh, reduction in terms of data costs, logistic services, et cetera. Then there's a, you know, an increase in a lot of these open challenges, um, you know, like Grand Challenges Canada, USAID has a number of challenges now, especially with COVID, MIT Solve, Innovations Against Poverty. There's so many challenges out there 
um, where, you know, you may think, okay, is it like me applying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, the lottery? Um, but if you have a solid system in-house for, um, uh, for proposal development, right? And you're very clear on kind of what your focus is. This, some of these challenges, it really, it really shouldn't take you too much time to, to um, you know, adjust what you've already developed and apply for some of these. I, it, you know, I, 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 I have a number of colleagues, you know, in the, in the social enterprise um, arena who say, oh, it's such a waste of time and it's so distracting, et cetera. Um, but I, I think if you are able to get a well uh, oiled engine, right, in terms just, you know, initially, especially if you're an earlier organization, actually, I'll, I'll say earlier to kind of medium term organization, because a lot of times these open challenges are more, more comfortable with medium term um, organizations than they are with early organizations. I would say just focus on that and, um, you know, really try to get your proposal development team sol like solidly together. Um, so that it just requires, you know, some iterations, et cetera, so that you can create options. I fundamentally believe create the options, then decide. And then fellowships. Obviously, I mean, I'm an Ashoka fellow and I've benefited so much, you know, on so many areas, right? Just being part of this phenomenal network, having technical support, having financial support, having so many folks to kind of test our ideas with. It's been fundamental, phenomenal, not just, not just for me, but for our organization as a whole. Acumen Fund, Echoing Green, there's many others that you can see here. So um, I've highlighted on the right kind of what I said in terms of investing in a proposal development team or a writer, knowing that a good writer cannot make up for a mediocre proposal, okay? Yeah. Um, so so if, you, if you have had a lot of fails, I guess, on the, on, on the, on the acceptance, in terms of your acceptance yeah, rate, yeah. reach out to people who've succeeded. Um, a lot of people are willing to actually share with you, uh, you know, how, how they've been successful. Data always wins. So I highlight that a lot, you know, make sure your proposals are so filled with solid data that highlight the problem and are very clear about your solution. Um, and then the last piece is Twitter is your friend for finding opportunities. Um, we can share with you a number of, a number of uh, email or a number of sites where you can find out what the latest opportunities are. But I will tell you that a number of the grants that we've received, we found on Twitter. We did not find through the emails or our network. It was literally on who we followed in Twitter. Um, we applied and then you know, we received um, the funds. There's also a book that I would recommend, uh, Social Innovation in Africa by Ndidi Wuneli that has a lot of these grants across, is that even though it says it's Africa, it's actually relevant for the entire globe um, as well. Okay, so in terms of, um, so, so, so Neka, thank you for that. And that was more on the grant side and accelerators. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, the, tra the traditional investors in the capital markets. Um, so they fall into three main buckets. You have DFI, so development financial institutions. These are larger organizations backed by governments, et cetera. Uh, the German government has one called GIZ. Uh, Swedish government has the CEDA, USID is in this category as well, CDC uh, is all in this category. So these are large organizations. They, some of them have um, challenges that they put out that are, you know, if you do well in those challenges, you can have follow on funding throughout the course of your, uh, your uh, relationship with them. Um, then you also have fund managers. So these are traditional uh, VCs for some of you who are looking in that realm as well. Uh, traditional VCs um, that invest in social enterprises, uh, but obviously want a return on the investment as, as most other organizations do. And then finally, you have um, institutional investors. So these are your big um, corporations, uh, banks, et cetera, usually backed by investment banking um, um, arms that just purely look for opportunities to invest in. Now this is further along down the line in terms of where you are in your in, in your funding. Some social enterprises become, you know, big enough for these kind of funds to be able to invest in them. Uh, yeah. So in terms of the funding strategy, um, here if you consider, I think Neka might have touched a little bit on them. Yeah. But 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 here are just a few other tidbits. 
And, and even before we go into it, I would just highlight the internally generated piece, right? So, um, so when I was leading the Africa portfolio for um, the US-based NGO, uh, I came into it with a negative, um, like a large, uh, 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 I guess, uh, just negative margin. And uh, my big, you know, I, it, it was a, again, because it was US based, it, our overhead costs were quite high and there were areas that I couldn't necessarily control uh, because the grants that we received would only have, you know, would only allow a certain percent of indirect costs, right? But when your overhead is more than the indirect costs that the grants allow, automatically you're going to have um, negative margin. And so for me in year one, I said, look, we can't, this cannot be the way that we're functioning. We've got to, um, we've got to break even, right? So no matter what that our focus before impacts, I said, we're going to break even because, you know, if we're able to be just, if we're able to actually generate some level of profit, we're going to be able to have greater impact um, sustainably, right? And it's the idea is that we just don't essentially lead to the end of this portfolio. So um, what we had to do was look internally and say, what are our core competencies? What, ha what have these grants actually built in us and from a competency perspective that we can now monetize, right? So through the grants, we did a lot of capability building. We did a lot of training of different health system leaders, ex um, doctors, nurses, et cetera. And so then we said, well, are people willing to pay for this? Um, outside of these grants? Are there, are there people in other countries who might find this um, relevant to them? And can we offer it at a price point that they can, that is, you know, palatable to them? So I used my existing team, again, that was covered by grants, right? So they were covered by grants 100%. They had to work extra hours. So they had to work beyond the eight hours that the grant paid for to do business development, understand what the opportunities were in the rest of Africa, doing, you know, essentially doing surveys, asking people, um, would this training, is this training relevant for you? Very basic questions. We literally called up people on the phone. Are you, um, how much would you be willing to pay for it, et cetera. So understanding that um, helped us develop uh, affordable training programs that allowed us to break even in that first year and then generate solid um, margins that, we then reinvested in our portfolio. We grew from being in three countries to 13 countries in Africa by leveraging that approach. And it completely changed everything. So I think it's very important for you also to just look internally, what are your competencies? What are you doing well? Where are you making, where could you make money? Um, and, and, and can you offer that as a service as well? Okay, so on the funding strategy side, um, so this is, so we know kind of the ask for you all for the program is to develop a funding strategy. And so just kind of highlighting overall what it is, right? So it's essentially a, a very systematic approach to building a reliable revenue base for your company. Um, we've talked about the spectrums of organizations. So it will combine different funding surface, sources into a constellation that's different for every single organization. And it's not just different for every single organization Today, it may be different for you in three years, right? Um, so for, you know, for instance, one nonprofit might be funded 50% through grants, 30% through events like conferences or virtual webinars that they hold, 15% through a membership program, which may allow, for instance, hospitals to have access to certain kinds of um, aggregated data, and then 5% through in-kind donations where people just, they, they've made it easy for people to donate five, 10, $20 here or there, um, for, for unrestricted services. So the thing, the consideration for you right now is to look at what is your current approach to funding and do you have it documented, what that approach to funding is and also to learn from how other people are fund, um, funding themselves. When we started MDOC, I actually talked to a number of different folks who were in the social enterprise arena to understand how they had gone about it. Some people had run to VC from the get-go. We were of the belief that we could demonstrate our business model with uh, bootstrapping awards and grants and then move to the VC route. So everybody is different, but it's better to talk to people to learn their approaches and see what you can take from that. And then the third piece is to ev evaluate the revenue potential and costs of your different um, funding models, select your funding model to implement and then develop an implementation plan. 
Okay. And then just in terms of just a few, uh, few points that you need to take advantage of, you have to define your investor or your funding mix. I mentioned already initially, you have to make sure that your mission is aligned to the funder if you're looking at just grant funding. And you also have to make sure that your mission is aligned to the investor. Um, it, fundraising is a, is, a, is, a, is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So that means that you need to create a big enough funnel to ensure that you have enough names that come into that funnel because not everybody's gonna say yes to your idea or nobody is going to say yes to your funding um, um, ask. So you have to make sure that you are, you know, you have a lot of names in your funding um, funnel so that, you know, it's, it's a numbers game, right? The more names you have in that funnel, so the more likelihood is that you're going to get to where you want to get. And it also depends on where you are in that funding um, in, in that growth phase. If you're earlier along, nobody really knows who you are, et cetera, you would need a lot of names in that funding funnel, probably about 100 to 200 names to be able to eke out the investments or the funding that you're seeking. If you're further along in that investment, uh, in, 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 in your evolution as a company and people know your name, you're out there, that number obviously de decreases to about 50 in that funnel. And the further along you are 10 or 15. So you, and to manage this whole process, you wanna make sure you're using leveraging technology to do this. There are a lot of um, tools out there like Founder Circle, um, uh, DocSend, et cetera. We can send you all the lists that you can use to manage this entire process. They help you in create your, they help you look search in databases for who the investors are out there or who the funders are out there. They help you ensure you manage all your documentation because people are going to see what's your, what's your thesis? Like what, what are you bringing to the table? Pitch me on this idea. So traditionally you have an investment deck, you might have other things that go with that, um, um, with, with that equation as well. So these kind of platforms enable you to manage all that. And obviously after once, if you're successful and you get an investment, you are going to have to give uh, periodic updates to those investors. And that also managing that process could be quite tedious. So these actually help you you send, you click, you write a letter once or write an investment investment once, uh, an update once, and you send it out to a whole bunch of investors that invested. In. And just again, that's you know for those of you who are interested in the um, on the you know moving from nonprofit to to the for profit side, yeah. this still matters for those on the nonprofit side. Absolutely. Uh, I will tell you that um, with we have found that. When we give updates, regular updates, I mean, and you know, we have it on the calendar. There's a dedicated person who develops these updates to the people that um, are investing in us, whether from a grant perspective or not, uh, they love it, right? So you, so you have to have that system in place. You can't, you know, it, 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 you, you, you don't wanna underestimate how important that is. You also don't wanna underestimate how important it is to respond to somebody who may have, you may have started a conversation and responding to them three days later versus one day later, honestly may make a difference in terms of you receiving um, investments, uh, you know, from a grant or, or, or non-grant perspective. Okay. And a lot of you also have um, websites that say, if you don't have one, make sure you get one. And if you do have one, make sure that you are using all the tools of SEO. So search engine optimization to ensure that if somebody is looking, for example, to invest in X, what companies, uh, you know, they might go into a search engine and say, hey, I need to invest in a social enterprise that is focused on water. Just make sure that your SEO is, is there so that your name comes up or your website comes up once, you know, that person does their search so you can have inbound traffic, right? And social, along those same lines, social media is your friend. So it's not just on the SEO side, but it's also on social media. I mean, the world obviously has changed tremendously and COVID has even changed that even more. Right, so people are looking more now to, to technology to help them understand what is going on. You're not able to do that visits or that site visits or that road show that you'd have had to do before. Now you have to leverage uh, social marketing tools and just make sure that your web presence is really is really up to snuff. So to that point, we uh, you know during at, at the peak of COVID, I mean I, many of us are experiencing the second surge, but I guess at, for the first surge. We um, we did a, we kind of shared our work a lot on Instagram and uh, Twitter, 
and we were and, and LinkedIn. I mean, even LinkedIn, I, I personally think we could have even, you know, leveraged that platform better. But still, we had so many people reach out that we did not know um, because of our, our use of social media that wanted to invest in us because of our work in COVID. So, so don't underestimate really kind of building your presence on these different platforms. Yeah, and then um, the last is uh, uh, just have a, you have, so when somebody's asking you for information about your company, you want to make sure that you have all these tools in place. You, all your brochures are set ready. Everything that you need to respond quickly to that person is already set up. So you're not scrambling last minutes to try and find these marketing materials or create these marketing materials. You already have them ready to go. Uh, so somebody asks you, you can send that immediately. Yeah, and there, and make sure these marketing materials are uh, custom, you know, customized for the different segments that you uh you are you know targeting make sure they have impact impact information right so if you're approaching the un um, or any of the un agencies have you gone to their or usaid as an example have you gone to go and read whatever their annual statements are what matters to them how do your marketing materials uh you know they talk about impact what are the impact metrics that they value are you ensuring that your 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 communication highlights those metrics if you if you share essentially kind of the same focus as they do? Um, we I hear often that we don't do that enough, and that's really a critical not not MDoc but just in general people don't do that enough, and that's a major issue for a lot of um, organizations that want to fund. Okay. Yeah, and last one is just have make sure you have a compelling video. A lot of us are doing very impactful work. There is nothing that tells a story better than having a video that is compelling. So just if you can, just make sure that you have one of those things. And the tools, there are tools today. I mean, I hope that you know what we're saying is not well, <laughs> from a from a don't you know from a financial perspective. You're like, okay, but I, it's you know, it's a team of three or it's a team of one. How am I going to do this? But there are so many tools right now that actually facilitate um, you making good videos, right? So that's or you can go to sites like Upwork um, where you can find people who for a very small price are willing to make, you know, a, a good video for you. Okay. So just in terms of getting ready for investment. Um, yeah, so, so the things that you need to focus on are, you know, are highlighted here. You know, again, you wanna make sure that, you know, you do some soul searching, right? You, we say we are social enterprises, et cetera, but are you, are you really uh, recognized as an innovative, credible and accountable leader uh, with experience and you're committed, you have a committed team that's actually gonna help you deliver on this? That's something you have to ask yourself. And if there are any gaps in there, you wanna make sure you show those gaps up, right? Um, you just have to, if, you, if you, you make sure that you have a positive track record based, you, you, what that means is you just make sure that you're always delivering on what it is that you say you, do, you are going to do. If you say, for example, I'm going to have an impact on the lives of people uh, living with chronic health needs, for example, you want to make sure that 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 impact that you're having is backed by data, right? It's backed by data, it's backed by data, it's backed by data, so that you can tell a compelling story. Data doesn't lie, as they say, and if you don't have data to back your work up, it's going to be hard for you to tell a, 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 a credible story. Um, you also want to make sure you have all the governance structures in place. Um, we mentioned that earlier at the beginning of this of this conversation. You want to make sure you are structured in the right way. Um, you know, depending on what kind of funding that you are looking for. So if you're moving from the traditional non-for-profit to a socially re responsible business, you want to make sure that you you, you evolve that funding structure. You evolve that legal structure. So you move from you know, uh, limited by guarantee to an LLC so that you can actually receive that investment. Um, and then do you have a market opportunity? Are you also solving a market? I mean, you're, you are. So, I mean, that's a moot point um, because you are a social enterprise. Um, and then, um, and so have you also, can you demonstrate that you're a healthy business? Um, meaning, you know, again, do you have- Are they said financial statements? statements? Etc. Do you have all those all those structures in place that investors are going to ask you for, or funders are going to ask you for? 
It's not just investors anymore. Funders are asking you, I'd like to see your auditor financial statements the last three years, please. You want to make sure you have all those structures in place so those don't cause any barrier to you receiving um, investment. And you know what's in them, yes. right? So if, you, you know, with your, your, your finance team, uh, you understand fully, uh, you know, are they, are they capturing, for instance, your, the in-kind support that you may be getting from because you're part of an accelerator? Yeah. Are you ensuring, you know what I mean? So that they're truly uh, painting the correct picture of your reality as an organization, especially if you're at the earlier stages of growth when um, funders are, have let, you know, lower risk appetites for investments. Yeah. And if you're a for-profit venture, uh, as some of you indicated you are, you want to, again, for investors, is uh, what's the exit? Is my money going to get stuck in here, et cetera? If you're a social, the other bucket is your social enterprise. What is the, what is the impact? Is my money going to just go into an abyss and not have any impact, which, which is their return on investment? Want to make sure that whatever you are doing actually truly does have an impact. And again, that impact is backed by the data. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also want to just, again, soul searching, searching what kind of risks e exist in your organization today and what kind of risk strategies are you putting into place? Because they're going to ask you, hey, what risks do you see uh, are, are, are inherent in me investing my money into? You have to make sure you define two or three risks and also come up with two or three mitigation strategies for these things because it's extremely important. You will find that many funders do not want to um, uh, provide grants they don't want to be the sole source of revenue exactly. for um, NGOs or yeah. for nonprofits. Yeah. And so how are you, how is your portfolio, your funding portfolio diversified? What does that mix look like so that you're not just guessing from this one funder? Because a lot of people will say, we love your model. We love what you're doing. We love your data. You have the system in place. You have the great board. But if we're the only ones that are going to be funding you for the next three years, we can't do we it. Can't do it. You don't want that to be your situation. Yeah, you just want to make sure you diversify your funding mix. I think, uh, yeah. So we've talked about this, yeah. just the opportunities in terms of really looking internally, what can you, what can you provide? What um, assets do you have that you can leverage to generate this um, revenue? And I think this is a really critical piece because it affords you, unfortunately, a lot of grants today are still very restricted. And unfortunately, a lot of organizations are still very reactive. So they'll, you know, oh, this grant is on, um, you know, water and sanitation. Okay, let's start doing water and sanitation. Oh, oh, that grant is on, um, you know, chronic disease. Let's go and do chronic disease. And you kind of lose your footing and lose your purpose. Lose because your mission. Lose your mission because you're just responding to these grants and you're trying to stay alive and pay salaries. And you don't want that to be your reality. So you want some level of buffer, some level of cushion that allows, gives you the runway to be able to determine how you grow and how you move. And this is where these paid services really make a difference. Okay, so this piece, and, I, and we're just about the end because I know we've gone a little bit over, is that um, for those of you who are for-profit and also for young goal or local NGOs, you might, because again, there's much lower risk appetite, you um, may want to explore finding a fiscal sponsor. So this essentially is uh, an organization that will receive the funds so on, the, your behalf, on your behalf at a fee, at a fee um, anywhere from, I think it's 5 to 15% um, of what the overall grant uh, piece is. And they're going to manage, they will administer the grant to you and also take responsibility for the fiscal aspects of it as well. Uh, and this is, I mean, there's, you know, this, we know a number of um, companies that have taken this route. It's really helped them in terms of establishing their footing. Their footing. Um, and now they're, they're, they're actually huge. So this um, is a real, this is an interesting model for you to look at. If you are a, uh, an older NGO, this may be a revenue opportunity for you to become, if you have been established with some of the bigger players out there, the USAID, the DFIDs, the BMGFs of the world, you may want to actually take this on as something you do. You become, so, so here, here's a for-profit um, social enterprise over here. Um, you know, there's a company that cannot give them grants because they only are allowed to give grants to charities. So they will give the grant to you, your NGO. Uh, you take 5% of the overall cost, you manage, and then you provide the rest to the um, for-profit social enterprise 
uh, and all you really are in charge of is kind of the fiscal aspects of it. And it's a, we've also seen people do very well, you know, looking at this as an internally generated revenue model as well. All right, uh, introduction, okay, we talked about this already. Yeah, so just looking, this is just a point about, you know, you can still do this with COVID, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, sending emails, seeing who's in your network, who can connect you with other um, folks. The point being, don't just look at funders, how about innovation hubs that have links to yeah. funders? Um, you know, just don't forget that if, you know, even if you talk to this one person, this one person may think about, you're not fun, that one person may not fund you, but they may know down the line, two five years later, people. somebody at five other people that will fund you. Also universities that you may want to partner with for data, for evidence-based design that people are increasingly more and more interested in. Okay, and that's the end of that. Yeah. Okay, so should we pause to see if there are any questions before? I, I know we don't have tons of time. Um, Paula, Mark, can we take any questions before we move to the... Um, um, oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, yeah. we'll be moving uh, into the Q and A if the uh, presentation um, has come to an end. So, thank okay. you for that presentation. Uh, we have about twenty minutes or less to take some questions, and um, we would like uh, the, to have the questions in the chat, please. If you can write your questions in the chat. We'll be able to take them uh, as um, a come up. Okay, we see one question there. It's here. Okay, can't see. I'll try this one. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so the first question that we see here is, um, what do you usually consider in your shareholder updates, emails slash drafts? Yeah, so, okay, so I'll take it from two perspectives here, right? Again, it depends on where you receive the funding from. If it's from a traditional investor, they want to see what milestones you have achieved uh, because of the funding or how close you are to that milestone. Because we think about it as a journey, right? You have to achieve X to in order to unlock Y, right? And then how you get from point A to point X is a journey. And every other, every update that you provide in between that is how am I getting closer to that uh, um, um, destination? So for example, if you are releasing a new application that will help you get closer to that, uh, destination, that will be an update you want to put together in an email and send out. Um, looking at it from the other side of the equation, if it was from a funder, for example, um, for, for, for funders is usually what things are you doing uh, that, you know, they can also share with their networks uh, as to how they are spending their money on their investees, right, or their grantees. For example, if you're if you are doing any uh, anything in code, for example, uh, and and it's you know is it if it's trying to help uh, women of you know help help women etc. Um, you you can put that in an investor in in a in a in an email update and send to your um, send to your funder as a for for them to be able to showcase you know to their board. Hey, look look at what my invest my my investee is doing. Um, it, it, they're actually having an impact. So for, on that, from that perspective, it will be, what things am I, am I doing that are under the, the um, umbrella of what I need to do as an, an investee to be able to uh, move that process forward? We also have a rich question here. I can try to translate it. It looks I like- yeah. I you, understand. Yeah, I, so I mean, so, so I, mean, I think, so I thank you very much for the presentation. I, uh, I'd love to understand the comp how to find raise the funds through Twitter, right? Uh, that's what I understand. How I can raise the funds through Twitter. So, so, um, so yeah. So, so the 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 way that we've um, done this is uh, is to essentially um, we've done it in uh, the, when I say raise funds through Twitter, it's following who are you following on Twitter. So start with your your Twitter page, 
who are you following? So are you, uh, you want to follow other funders? Um, you also may want to follow uh, organizations like yourselves that may be in your geography, but around the world and see who they're following, right? Or see what they talk about. Um, so that's what you really want to do. Um, that will really help you in terms of um, getting to know who's out there because what they do is a lot of times they will put their uh, grants, that their, their challenges, their competitions, they will put it on Twitter. And they obviously, they put it also in their email list. So you want to sign up for these email lists, but you also need to put it on Twitter. Um, you also, you will find out about it on Twitter. So you, you don't have to be active, you know, type writing on Twitter or anything, but check your Twitter every day, right? And make sure you're following the people that you may want to receive funds from at some point or people who are like you. Um, so that you can then go and, um, you know, see the advertisements, et cetera, from them. That will really help a lot. Like I said, it's, it, for us, it's been huge. It's really helped us. Great. So if there aren't any more questions, I'm happy to send us all to the breakout room. Uh, let me turn on my video. Uh, first, I just want to say, Neka, Imo, thank you so much for the presentation. This was really informative. I know I've learned a lot. And if it's OK with you all, uh, we would love to share the presentation um, and also follow up with you on those additional resources with the group um, of participants after um, the webinar. OK, um, that's true. That's fine. Yeah, th thank you again. Now, the breakout groups are created. Some of you all have not listed your, your language. So I made a guess. If you are in the wrong breakout room because you don't speak the language, just come back to the main room and we will reassign you. Um, there's an exercise associated with this and I'm gonna assign folks to each breakout room to help, walk, help you walk through the exercise. Um, and Nika, you move, uh, let me know if this works. There are three options. Um, should we just let them choose? the option that they want to work on or, yeah. you know, we, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we're going to share, once we put you in breakout rooms, you'll have someone join you who will share the exercise. Okay. So, um, you know, um, you won't, that won't happen immediately. Just give us a few minutes to make sure we have everyone assigned with someone who can facilitate the exercise. Okay. So with that being said, I'm going to, I'm going to open the breakout rooms. And if you um, are in the wrong breakout room, again, just come back to the main room and we'll reassign you. So hold on for one second. Okay, folks, great, great job. Great job on the presentation. Carlos, if you can hear me, could you please go to the breakout room? Are you there, Carlos? Daniel? Asata? Are you all there? Are you all there? Okay, uh, now um, Neka, Imu, Chalanju, can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, so Chalanju, um, you have the presentation, you have the exercise slide, right? Can you hear me? Oh, maybe you can't hear me because of, let me turn it off. Chalanju, can you hear me? I, okay, let me message Chalanju. He said yes in the chat box. Oh, okay, okay, Chalanju, um, you okay? You're still the interpreter, and you have the presentation, right? Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to let you, I'm going to assign you to breakout room two, and then we're going to let you facilitate the, the exercise. Just give me one second. Chimaju, breakout room two. Great. Uh, so who would like to facilitate, oh, Maria, I'm going to actually, I'm going to send you to the Spanish room. One second. Oh, Maria, did I already put her there? Okay. Someone else has joined breakout room two. Okay, it looks like, all right, so um, great work, folks. It looks like we just have the uh, East Africa and West Africa teams here. Who would like to facilitate the English speaking uh, breakout session? Uh, Paula, would that be you? Sure, I can go ahead with it. Okay, I, I can assign you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so um, are you going to facilitate the English speaking group, the breakout session? Yes, I can, I can. Okay, let me, let me there then. Okay. Breakout one. It returned me automatically back to the main session. Okay, let me try to reassign you. Hold on for a second. Okay. okay that's weird because I see you. Um, do, do you have another invite to go to another breakout room, Paula? Because I see you in that room. It just says not joined. No, it was just one I received now. And then when I moved, it then pushed me back. Okay. Or should I leave and then try to join the call again? Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can fix this. Um, move to. Yeah, try, try quickly to join the call again because I think I put you in a wrong breakout room and I tried to move you here. And for whatever reason, you can't join. Or do you, do you not see any invite to join a breakout room? No, I can't see anyone right now. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, if you can rejoin, then I, I can reassign you. That may work. Hello. There you are. Um, yeah. Okay, let me send you there. Okay. Okay. So to. All right, Paula, you should have an invite. Are you there, Paula? 
Paula, you're on mute, but you should have an invite to, there you are. All right, great. 